get ready for a wild ride. Miss Serfozo kicks things off by calling her daughter, Sinite, her miracle baby, thanks to the slim odds of her pregnancy. Despite this miracle, she drops a bombshell by revealing that Sinite could potentially have one of three dads, including Mr. Miller. Just when you think you've grasped the scenario, it twists even further. This is just the beginning, folks. Buckle up for a roller coaster of emotions and revelations. All your dads have been offense. Hang on to your seats. This is getting intense. Judge Lake steps in to highlight how crucial DNA evidence will be in cutting through the fog of he said, she said, especially since Mr. Miller admits his memory might be a bit fuzzy. As the DNA results loom large, the anticipation in the courtroom is palpable. Keep your eyes peeled, because the next reveal is a game changer. Luckily for the now, team, and the DNA evidence will be the jury. There are other possible fathers as well. Paul at my best friend's house. The plot thickens. Miss Serfozo's striking resemblance between him and her daughter. This claim meets Mr. Miller's skepticism head on, creating a clash of perceptions and emotions. What unfolds next will either shatter a assumptions or reinforce doubts. Don't touch that dial. They Just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, Mr. Miller pulls out his trump card uh, during the critical period. This alibi challenges everything Ms. Serfozo has claimed so far. As the courtroom buzzes with speculation, prepare for the tension to skyrocket. The courtroom drama escalates from here, and you won't want to miss a single moment. Uh -huh. Tissues at the ready, this part tugs at the heartstrings. Ms. Serfozo opens up about the trials of single motherhood, emphasizing the lack of support she's faced and the burden of not knowing her child's father. Her heart heartfelt disclosure sheds light on the personal toll behind the legal drama. As emotions run high, the stage is set for even more revelations that promise to stir the pot even further. No. Talk about a plot twist. The results are in. Pertain Brace yourselves for the roller coaster ahead. Ms. Lee lays down the law to Judge Lake, emphatically stating that Mr. Green has denied the fatherhood of her son, Kingston, ever since she broke the news of her pregnancy. She boldly claims that today marks the end of Mr. Green's denials, signaling a fierce determination to establish paternity once and for all. You might want to buckle up because the ride is just getting started. You have come to court today with one goal in mind, to prove to Mr. Green that he fathered your three-year-old son, Kingston. Mr. Green has denied your son from the moment you got pregnant, but today, his denial will end. And here comes the curveball. Mr. Green claps back hard, arguing that he is not the father, and points the finger at someone he calls Ms. Lee's sugar daddy, hinting that he's the real dad due to his age and closeness to Ms. Lee. The audience can't help but gasp at the accusation, setting the stage for more fireworks. Get ready, because the sparks are about to fly. You say you know exactly who Kingston's father is, and it's not you. It's Ms. Lee's sugar daddy. He's more than twice her age. You won't believe this twist. In a heartfelt plea, Ms. Lee recounts the uphill battle she's faced with Mr. Green's persistent denial of their three-year-old son. She highlights his disappointing absence in both presence and support, especially during key moments like Kingston's third birthday. The tension is thick, and it's about to get thicker as the drama unfolds. Mr. Green has been denying my child day one. He's been denying them for three years. He has never came around like he's supposed to. I have to call. I have to do so much to get this man into my child's life. But at the end a day, I just want him to step up. Kingston three, he just turned three June third. So and he didn't do nothing for his birthday. He I try to meet her when? halfway, but her attitude. My attitude has nothing to do with you stepping up. up for your child. Did that really just happen? In a dramatic revelation, Ms. Lee drops a bombshell about a late night call she made to Mr. Green's girlfriend using his own phone while he was asleep. This messy triangle shocks everyone in the courtroom, adding layers of complexity to the case. Trust me, the next turn is even more jaw dropping. At the point me and her was talking, it was back and forth. We was never no their relationship. She knew I had a girlfriend. Oh. I told her he moved either. into my home. So if I try to break him up, are you in my home? She knew I had uh, a girlfriend. Uh, he knew he had a girlfriend. So that's his problem. She knew it too. That ain't got nothing so to do with me. Like, to your girlfriend, you lived in the house with Miss Lee. Oh, he could, and I called him. He did. Oh, from his phone. So yeah, I snuck, called the girl, say, let her know your dude over here, and I'm pregnant. Oh. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. Mr. Green tries to shift the narrative by presenting screenshots of Ms. Lee's provocative Facebook posts, which seem to flaunt her single status and interest in other men. He uses this to question her character and motives, igniting further controversy. Just wait, the courtroom is about to heat up even more. Honest, she's on Facebook making a crazy post, talking about some who want, who out here got the best D and talking about other men stuff like that. Wait, you got- Don, I got it oh, right here. Let me see this evidence, Jerome. Oh, he just seen the- you submitted to the court face posts from Ms. Lee that say, is it wrong to have choices on men all on the first day just in case the D ain't good? Just asking. That was recently. That oh. ain't, and that's not when King was born. This is getting spicy. Ms. Lee shares the desperate lengths she's gone to in an attempt to involve Mr. Green in their son's life, including seductive maneuvers just to get him to visit. Her candid confession paints a picture of a mother fighting against the odds. The stakes are high, and the next
next revelation is set to raise them even higher. I just want him to up because at the end of the day, he knows that he's doing wrong. I can count on my hands how many times he has seen his child end up sleeping in a hotel together. You know what I'm saying? So he can watch his child. So you're at the point that you've even had sleep with him? Right. Do you remember? To get him to come around? It's not true, young. You got a smirk on your face, man. Cause he know. No, because I went over there. I went over there, but I didn't. We didn't do nothing. We did something. Can things get any more tangled? Flashback to the beginning of it all. Ms. Lee describes the moment she discovered she was pregnant and immediately informed Mr. Green, who doubted paternity from the start. This foundational conflict sets the stage for all the ensuing drama. Keep watching as the plot thickens in the courtroom drama. And then I guess he didn't believe me, so he took me to the clinic. They told him I was pregnant. So when he found out, he denied right then and there. Y'all said some old dude she was talking about for the baby was shower. In my home. He buys her clothes and stuff. Like, who does that for nothing? No, what he's talking about is that came out of my sugar daddy's car one day. Uh, he dropped So you do off. have a sugar daddy? Yeah, I got a good sugar daddy. My sugar daddy been there for 10 years, never ever left my side. I would never leave him. He come way before this. Fasten your seatbelts for this doozy. Judge Lake challenges Mr. Green on his reluctance to seek a paternity test earlier, despite his doubts, highlighting his role in prolonging the uncertainty that looms over Kingston's young life. Mr. Green's vague responses add more mystery to their tangled history. The climax is near, and it promises to be a shocker. But now, Kingston yeah. is three years old. <laughs> Why have you not asked for a paternity test before? Yeah, several times, John. John, I got a chart right here. This is an exhibit you brought? Yes, ma'am. Please, exhibit step over. First of all, he was born on June 3rd. I went to the hospital. I asked the hospital, you know, can we go ahead and get DNA testing done, whatever. So a few days later going by, she's telling me, oh, it's time to come outside. He was just born this and that. She refused right then, Your Honor. <laughs> and now for the grand finale. The entire courtroom holds its breath as Judge Lake reveals the results of the DNA test. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Green, you are the father. Told you! I told you! Look at him! Buckle up, because this is just the beginning. Ms. Brueger steps up with a bold claim that her son, Harish Brooks Jr., was fathered by the defendant's now-deceased grandson. She details the tragic death of the father in an auto accident two months prior and is here fighting for her son's rights to his father's benefits. If you think this is intense, just wait for what's coming up next. Ms. Brueger, you are here to prove to the defendant that your son, Parrish Brooks Jr., was fathered by the defendant's grandson who was killed two months ago in an auto accident. Now, Ms. Warner, you are here with dog and you don't believe Harris Jr. is your great-grandson. Hang on to your seats. This is getting juicy. Judge Lake listens intently as Ms. Warner vehemently denies the paternity claim, throwing serious shade by accusing Ms. Brueger of chasing after the family fortune. She drops a bombshell, claiming the grandson was sterile, which throws a wrench in the whole paternity debate. The stakes are high and the courtroom's heating up. Don't miss what happens next. You say the plaintiff has dragged you to court today because she wants in on your family land and oil trust. All right, you claim your granddaughter knows for a fact your grandson was sterile. Yes, Your Honor. Did that just happen? Emotions run high as Ms. Brueger passionately argues her case, insisting that the deceased had fully acknowledged her son as his own and even had plans to marry her. On the flip side, Ms. Warner labels her a gold digger, clearly not holding back any punches. The tension's building, and you won't believe the twist that's about to unfold. He is, in fact, your child's father. Yes, he's my son's father. Everything we were in a relationship, he asked me to marry him. That is my son's father. He never denied my son. And the fact that they're saying he was sterile, he was never told by a doctor had a child. Me and Parrish clearly had a conversation before he passed that he wasn't sure. You'll want to hear this. Things take a personal turn as the court delves into the deceased's involvement with the child. Ms. Brueger recounts how he supported her throughout the pregnancy and was devastated to miss signing the birth certificate. This saga has layers that keep peeling back. Stay tuned for the next emotional roller coaster. We lived together. We were a family. He told everyone my girls were his stepdaughter. He called them his stepdaughters. Everything. He was there through my whole pregnancy, all the doctor's appointments. And when you had the baby, was he at the hospital? No, he couldn't be there, but as soon as he got out, he was adamant about having the hospital hold on to the birth certificate before they turned it in so that he could sign it. You think it couldn't get more dramatic, but oh, it does. Accusations fly as Ms. Brueger defends her single mother stance, arguing she's doing her best under tough circumstances. Ms. Warner, still in disbelief about the child's paternity, expresses her grief and unresolved feelings. The air is thick with tension. Watch out for what's coming next. I raised Paris. It's my son born the whole time I 
I was with, he's been the one that's been around. I invited them to my son's first birthday party. That's not my son. That's why I didn't show and up. And if y'all felt this way about my son, why did y'all lie? I know Parrish and I wasn't. Was, Parrish is it, no longer here. He's no longer here now. But if your I son, can that why would you say so when he, when my son was born? Because I wasn't going to hurt Parrish. Parrish wanted never the baby been, so bad. Never... Just when you thought it was calming down, bam, allegations of infidelity and dishonest behavior throw the courtroom into a frenzy. Ms. Brueger defends her professional integrity as a cosmetologist amidst accusations that she had men over for more than just haircuts. This episode is turning into a soap opera. Brace yourself for more revelations. Parrish felt that. Used to have some dude come over to the house whose hair he was, she was always doing. You're paid for it. Parrish college. didn't like that. Call my grandmother and clearly stated. He was told me plenty of times that Rochelle was broken, that she was tainted. That's why he had to get out of the situation. Parrish, Ms. Warner, he was mm. saying he needed to get out of the situation. He's broken, Grandma. I cannot fix her. So she's crazy, Grandma. This guy keeps coming over there and doing her hair. He's Grab some popcorn because the family drama escalates further. Communication breakdowns after the deceased's passing cause more strife and misunderstandings among the family members. The courtroom becomes a hotbed for airing dirty laundry, and it's about to get even hotter with the upcoming revelations. Michelle, if it comes back, and that is his, it my is grandma him. even gonna be able to see, see the baby. I, you act so funny. So she funny wanted, with I'm him. I'm so funny, but, but why you act so funny with him. I wasn't there because my one-year-old was first, sick. I invited That's why. you, and I you didn't show up. And so how are you guys I'm gonna bring another that I don't invite you guys? See him? I you can. came a couple yes. times. No, you I didn't. Did. I have I have my own girl Parrish, about it. But how many I have times my own. Did, okay. I have my own. I'm kids. asking I for my grandma. Packed up my kids my grandma with cares her about house? him. Just when you think they're about to wrap up, there's a major twist. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Harvey is related Parrish Brooks Jr. Therefore, oh. Parrish Brooks Sr. is also related to Parrish Brooks Jr. Something we already do. Oh, your apology. Buckle up, here we go. Ms. Williams opens her case by requesting a DNA test to establish paternity for her two-year-old daughter, Michaela Brown, aiming to secure up to $153,000 in Social Security death benefits. She believes the deceased, Mr. Marcus Brown, is the father of her child and intends to file a claim for the benefits. You won't believe what comes next. It's a doozy. Ms. Williams, you've asked the court to administer a DNA test to establish paternity for your two-year-old daughter, Michaela Brown. You plan to file a claim asking that your daughter become the beneficiary of $153,000 in Social Security death benefits over the next 16 years because her potential father, Mr. Marque Brown, now deceased. Yes, Your Honor. Here's where it gets spicy. Ms. Potts and her daughter, Ms. Carr, express their skepticism about Mr. Brown being the biological father of Michaela. They suggest that other men in town could potentially be the father, indicating a complex situation with multiple possible outcomes. Stay tuned. The next part is a real jaw dropper. You and your daughter, Ms. Carr, have doubt that you're deceased son is the biological father and in fact claim that any number of men found could be this child's father. Yes, yes. Things just got real. A heated exchange occurs when Ms. Carr accuses Ms. Williams of being promiscuous, leading to a tense moment where family loyalty and personal attacks come to the forefront. This escalates the emotional intensity of the proceedings. Keep your eyes peeled. The revelations just keep coming. I don't. She's clearly. A clearly, I don't She's understand. She's a whore. And when this test proves that the baby is not my brother's baby, we want her to remove his name birth certificate. Why would you put his name on the birth certificate when he was dead and nobody knew that was his baby. He knew it was his baby. He didn't know. Why do you have so much doubt? It's not his baby. I was taking her to different men's houses to get throw her private part a party is what she would quote unquote say. Oh boy, did it just get hotter in here? Mrs. Carr details Ms. Williams's alleged behavior, describing how she would take her to various men's houses, which she sarcastically refers to as throwing her private part a party. This description paints a picture of Ms. Williams's controversial social life, which is central to the dispute over paternity. You might want to sit down for this next part. It's a real cliffhanger. So I started out taking her to come this person's house, where I would drop her off, come back an hour and a half later and pick her up. And she would bring the person outside. Well, she brought this person outside, a little sweaty, messed up, hair messed up, and now it's time to go. Manchester and McKinley dropping her off and picking her up. This person I never got a chance to meet, but it's a man, obvious. Me drop her off, and in that time frame, within that hour and a half, pick her back up. Did everyone catch that? In a crucial moment, Ms. Williams discusses her relationship with Mr. Brown, emphasizing that he acknowledged the pregnancy. This conversation is pivotal as it touches on the emotional and personal connections involved, alongside the legal implications. The next twist is something you have to see to believe. Did you get to speak to him anymore about? Yeah, we had a couple of telephone conversations when it was actually money on the phone for me to, for them to accept the collect calls. And what were those conversations about? It's not his baby. Did he ever say, this isn't my baby? No, I don't know what he said to any 
anybody else. I can only tell you what he told me. He we told hear me, the letter he told me that he wasn't the baby daddy. Hold on to your seats. A significant turning point occurs when Ms. Williams reveals that she never refused a DNA test and even offered to pay half of its cost. This moment highlights the ongoing conflict and the challenges in resolving the paternity issue amicably. The story takes an even more surprising turn up next. Don't blink now. She never brought that baby to us, and that's where the doubt lies. He was and like, well, my mama, the DNA I, I've never refused the DNA half. test. I offered to pay half on the DNA test. I don't have you half, didn't I say don't. That. Your quote, unquote, was, I don't, I'm not paying the other half. No. And I said, why not? Oh, you mean to tell yours. me when I first I came her, back from Lauren, jail, you didn't need a McKay, if she can get a DNA test? A DNA test. I hundred dollars to do the DNA test. She want to do it. And here it is, the big reveal. The climax of the episode is reached when the DNA test results are revealed. It has been determined by this court that the deceased, Mr. Mark K. Brown, was her father. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. Miss Hatcher just dropped a bombshell, admitting to having entanglements with not one, not two, but three men around the time her son Josiah was on his way to the world. She wants to clear the air and not let her past choices weigh down her son. And oh boy, you won't believe what comes next. Miss Hatcher, you confess that at the time you conceived your two-year-old son Josiah, you had sexual relations with three men. Now, you don't want your son to suffer for your mistakes. You've requested paternity testing on all three men. Yes, Your Honor. So here's Mr. Scott thinking he's possibly the only dad in the picture until, surprise, Miss Hatcher throws a curveball about needing a DNA test during a heated spat. This revelation has trust and deception written all over it. Wait till you see how Mr. Scott handles this news. You claim Miss Hatcher led you to believe you were the only potential father of this child until she told you in anger That's that true. she needed a DNA test. Yes, Your Honor. Just when things couldn't get more soap opera-esque, they pull out a calendar in court. Each man's day is marked in a different shade. They're dissecting the conception window like it's a crime scene. You'll want to stick around for the reactions to this color-coded drama. As we see here on the calendar, yellow represent you. For Mr. Blake, that's represented in the blue. We're looking at the window of concept. Okay. Mr. Sneed is in green. Cue the fireworks. Mr. Scott isn't just throwing shade. He's throwing the whole tree, questioning Miss Hatcher's choices pretty disrespectfully. The judge isn't having any of it, though, and puts him in his place. Applause from the audience included. Strap in, because the emotional roller coaster's just picking up speed. You say you had sex with him on the 23rd of December. One time. Did you use protection? No, we did not. How much did he pay? Excuse me, Mr. Scott? You gonna be respectful in this courtroom. This is him. He is a disrespectful man. He is very ignorant to me and my son. Recently, he knows that we don't have a work refrigerator and comes over to my house. Attitude, nasty attitude that he has. Mr. Scott spills his guts about why he's got a mountain of doubt over being Josiah's dad. From signing birth certificates to changing diapers, he thought he was in the clear until the deep word DNA test popped up. The tension is thick, and you'll want to see how the judge slices through it next. I'm doubtful because she said out of her own mouth, DNA test. I didn't know nothing about her situation. When she came and told me she was pregnant, I believed her because she's a woman who knows her body, who knows what she does. It's so when the baby was born, were you in the hospital? I was there for him. And did you sign the birth certificate? Yes, I did. I have it right here. Signed the birth certificate. Jerome, hand I've me been that buying birth certificate. diapers. I've been buying play pens. I've been. Talk about a plot twist. The debate heats up with Mr. Scott and Miss Hatcher, going head to head over who said what about Joe. Josiah's paternity. It's like watching a tennis match where every serve is a scandalous revelation. Keep watching. The next serve is a doozy. And then after I brought my son home after having a C-section, came in the house and he said, my girlfriend said, Josiah might not be mine. And Josiah wasn't home two days yet. Your Honor, do you know that and this is the second lady, Your Honor, that has come to me, told me that I am the father of her child. Sign a birth certificate, 99% wasn't mine. Enter Mr. Blake with a foggy memory of a hotel room and some holiday cheer, hinting that Josiah might just be his after all. Alcohol and memory, lapses make for a great story, don't they? But the truth is just a sip away, and you'll want to see how this part of the puzzle fits. Did you sleep with Miss Hatcher on the 26th of December? That's the day after Christmas. You should remember that. We got a hotel room that night. Billy and Clip is mine. I don't have a problem with taking care Was of mine. Was it for sex on that day? I, we had a little alcohol, but I think so, Your Honor. Do you remember whether or not you two used protection when you... Yes, I do. Well, the first time, we did use protection, and then the second time, we did. Your Honor, it wasn't no second time. We now it's it's getting juicy. The courtroom turns into a battleground of words and accusations as everyone tries to defend their honor. Miss Hatcher and Mr. Scott aren't holding back, and neither is the judge. Don't touch that dial. The truth bomb is about to drop. Call them. You don't take care Call of your kids, and you know Call you don't. You don't pay child Call them and you ask them what they did. Ask them what kind of father He's I am. And I'm going to tell you something else. And it's not else. about that. I'm going to tell you Being something else. Being a man is stepping up to the plate. I'm going to let you all run your own case. 
and see what kind of results you get after this, because I got the real one. So go ahead. Mr. Scott takes a moment to pour his heart out, promising he's dad of the year material if Josiah turns out to be his. It's a touching monologue that might just bring a tear to your eye, or at least make you believe in his fatherly devotion. The verdict's coming up, and it's a real tearjerker. And we find out who his father is. Whether it is me, I want to know, because if he's mine, I want to be with him. I would give my last for my kids, and if that boy is mine, he gonna know he got love. When I'm around him, you best believe there's no negativity in his life. If I feel like we gotta yell, I will leave. I'm not finna do anything around that boy. And here it is, the moment of truth. Drum roll, please. In the case of Hatcher v. Scott Blake, need pertaining to whether Mr. Blake or Mr. Scott is the biological father of two-year-old Josiah Scott. When it comes to Mr. Blake, you are not the father. I'm sorry. Can you handle what's coming next? Miss Rayford insists that Mr. Freeman's shifty truth-telling tossed her right into a romantic mess. This entanglement bore them a son, Terry, who Mr. Freeman now refuses to recognize. She's heated about Mr. Freeman first begging for a child, then ditching her to reunite with his fiance, Ms. Triplett. Stick around because Mr. Freeman's clapback is priceless. Say, Mr. Freeman's inability to be honest has landed in the middle of a love triangle that produced eight-month-old son, Terry, whom he now denies. That after begging you to have his child, Mr. Freeman abruptly left your relationship, returned to his fiance, and started denying your baby. Yes, it is. Hold on to your popcorn. This gets good. Mr. Freeman paints his stint with Ms. Rayford as a mere fling, claiming she's now haunting him and his fiance with her obsession. He strongly doubts he's the father of Terry, alleging Ms. Rayford was not exactly playing solitaire during their fling. Up next, Ms. Rayford fires back, and you won't want to miss it. You say Ms. Rayford was nothing more than a fling who is obsessed with you and your fiance, Miss Triplett. You claim that during your brief time, Rayford, she was sleeping with multiple men. Is no way you are her son's father. Is correct, Yana. Just when you think it can't escalate, oh, it does. The judge grills Mr. Freeman on what he's done for baby Terry, and Ms. Rayford does not hold back, calling him a ghost dad. The crowd's reaction is everything as the courtroom drama escalates. Buckle up because the room's about to explode. What has Mr. Freeman done for him? Mr. Freeman hasn't done nothing. He has been a dad ever since he got Miss Triplett. Hold he's on, been first of all. Hold on, oh, first of all, Trina. If you ladies, that erupted from zero to a hundred in a less than one second. The drama meter is off the charts. Ms. Rayford demands Mr. Freeman to recognize his son and pushes for a name change to Freeman. Tempers flare as Ms. Rayford and Ms. Triplett exchange spicy words, prompting the judge to step in. What's coming up is even juicier. I want the world to know today that this is his son, so he could step up and be the man. First child, Terry, Michelle, Rayford, they need to be changed to Freeman. You need to grow up and be a man. Hold Don't on, let this all, woman dictate to you. All, you'll want to lean in for this one. Ms. Rayford is adamant that Mr. Freeman knows he's Terry's dad and scolds him for shirking his responsibilities. Their heated debate sheds light on Mr. Freeman's previous acknowledgments at the hospital. The chaos climbs as the judge tries to simmer things down next. Just be there for your son. You like to clown? Your son will love play with him and not me. It's not an issue of paternity. It's an he issue of him father, being responsible. And I'm letting you kind of scream it out because I can see how frustrated you are. I am. It, bring listen, it on down. I want to hear from Mr. Freeman. Miss Rayford has made some very strong accusations about being irresponsible to this child. Twist alert. Contrary to her previous claims, Miss Rayford admits Mr. Freeman did try to bring stuff over for Terry, showing a sliver of responsibility amidst the chaos. This partial concession mixes up the narrative as the courtroom buzzes with reactions. And guess what? It only gets crazier from here. Are you referring to that dresser thing? Nah, he referring to the stuff that he bought with Pampers clothes and stuff like that. Girl, stop uh, playing. So you know every nah, move that I'm man sure. make, huh? Oh, you jealous. You wish, you jealous. wish that was your... How can I be jealous? Miss Ray, the only thing I refused is on this particular day, saying that he had came by and he had bought a few items for the baby. The plot thickens substantially here. Mr. Freeman confesses his main reason for attending the hearing is to refute his fatherhood of Terry. Ms. Rayford lays out their rocky romance timeline, sparking more gasps and murmurs from the audience. The narrative deepens, and you'll be glued to what happens next. I'm here today to prove that I'm not Trina's baby daddy. Me and Trina was together. It was only just a fling. Trina was still having sex with multiple guys. She's obsessed with me. You were still having sex with other people. No, it's not true. We met in December. We met on a dating site. A dating Site. And Miss Triplett, I'm gonna ask while she's testifying, just keep your little talking. Just stop. Yes, ma'am. Gear up for more twists. Miss Rayford comes clean about her other liaisons during her time with Mr. Freeman, even mentioning protective measures with another man. This revelation adds layers to the paternity.
Trinity puzzle and complicates their narrative even further. The story takes a deeper dive as we edge closer to the truth. We met in December on a dating site. It was New Year. I wasn't expecting a baby and all these shenanigans. I picked him up and we hung out, brought in New Year's. We had a good time. I came from California to men, two men. I probably should have went with the first, but he was the second one. The first in the, in the relationship kind of overlapped. I am mature enough to know that, you know, when you have sex, you wear a condom. <coughs> and so I did do that with the other guy in January. You won't believe your ears here. The discussion veers into the specifics of Ms. Rayford's active love life and Mr. Freeman's contradictory comments about always using protection. As they untangle their past rendezvous, the anticipation for the DNA test results mounts. The courtroom is about to erupt with the next revelations. Yeah, that's why I say it's not an issue of paternity. He lies, she lies, but that ain't lying. That ain't lying. The hey. DNA test ain't lying. Everything matches up to what I'm saying. I don't have no reason to lie on this man. As you look at this timeline, is it your testimony? You were not intimate with Ms. Rayford between February 9th through the 14th. Grab your tissues or your popcorn. This is a doozy. The DNA results are in. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Freeman, you are not. You are the father. <laughs> Buckle up for this roller coaster. The case of Wolf v. of Cottle kicks off with a bang. Ms. Wolf steps up, alleging that her escapade of revenge sex has thrown her relationship with the defendant into chaos, and she's here to prove the paternity of her three-month-old son to mend the fractures. The judge nods along, confirming the case's focus and setting the stage. Get ready, the courtroom's about to turn into a soap opera scene. You're in court claiming revenge sex has now put your relationship in jeopardy with the defendant. You say the only way to save the family you were hoping to build is to prove to your fiance that he fathered your three-month-old son, Zane. Yes, Your Honor. You thought soap operas were dramatic? Listen to this Ms. Wolf admits to having revenge sex with her ex-boyfriend's buddy as a clapback for his cheating scandal. She explains that the whole sordid idea was cooked up by the friend she ended up getting busy with. This affair has twisted her current love life into a pretzel and brought her to court to sort out who the daddy is. Strap in, because the next revelation is a doozy. Um, revenge sex means that my ex-boyfriend, Luca, he cheated on me with one of my friends, talking to his friend, which was Andrew. Andrew was like telling me that, you know, we should get back at them. We should have revenge sex. We should. We did. While I was still dating, Lucas at the time was sleeping with Drew also. Hold on to your popcorn. Things are getting spicy. Ms. Wolf lays out the heart-wrenching tale of betrayal she endured when her then-boyfriend hooked up with one of her friends. Hurt and seeking vengeance, she turned to his friend, which only tangled her love life even further. The judge can barely keep up with the convoluted web of deceit. You'll want to stick around. The plot thickens even more. We met on a dating site, and I moved in with him about a week after meeting him. Two weeks in a relationship, I invited my friend to come hang out with me. While I was sleeping, I, I woke up and I went bedroom door. The door was locked, so I kept pounding on the door for them to open it. And I saw my friend's underwear that they had sex. And then I asked them, I was like, yeah, we did have sex. I'm sorry. No one saw this twist coming. Mr. Chittum enters the courtroom, throwing another layer of chaos into the mix. He confesses that he was the first to flip the loyalty switch by sleeping with Ms. Wolf's friend during their relationship. This bombshell leads to more dirty laundry being aired about ongoing deception and backstabbing. Just when you think it can't get crazy, Crazier, the next part will have your jaw on the floor. You were in a relationship with Miss Wolf first. That is correct, Your Honor. And you started a sexual relationship? Yes, Your Honor. And you all were living together? That is correct. And then she said she invited her friend to come, and you and the friend slept together? That is correct. So now how find out that intimate with your friend, Mr. Cottle? Uh, one of my friends texted me. So then did you confront Miss Wolf? Yes. What did she say? She was pretty much denying it all. So you didn't want to tell the truth, Miss Wolf? Ready for a curveball? The result of a polygraph test are unveiled, proving Mr. Chittum was truthful about his ongoing fling with Ms. Wolf during her pregnancy. This revelation throws a wrench into the paternity drama, with the audience reacting in a mix of disbelief and amusement. Brace yourself. What's coming next will flip the script. You met with a certified polygraph expert, and you were asked the following question. Did you have sexual intercourse during her pregnancy with Zane? The lie detector determined you were being truthful. Yes, that is truthful. Only up to I was pregnant, month. and you knew that. And I I never lied about that. This confession is a game changer. Ms. Wolf is busted for fibbing about cutting ties with Mr. Chittum, despite her claims of loyalty to Mr. Cottle. The judge calls out her dishonesty, emphasizing the tangled web she's woven with her lies. Mr. Cottle feels like a pawn in her game, his sense of betrayal magnified by the courtroom shockers. Fasten your seatbelts. The next bombshell is just around the corner. Have you ever heard the expression, crying wolf? Yes, I have. You telling this story. You were saying what he was saying was completely not true. You had Mr. Cottle up here talking about 
about he's a pathological liar. He just showed his phone and now you admit it. You are come over here and sleep with me. You are correct, I did. You saying he lied, I'm saying you lied too. Both of you lying, I'm... Even if you didn't sleep with him that time, I don't think Mr. Cottle appreciates the text messages alone. You're probably right. He's out working. Did anyone see this coming? The envelope with the DNA test results is finally opened. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Cottle. Are the biological father. Get ready for a wild ride. Ms. Beversdorf opens the case against Ms. James to prove that Ms. James's deceased son, Daryl, is the biological father of her son, Dakari. She claims that if she proves paternity, Ms. James should accept Dakari or risk never seeing him again. The statement sets a tense tone for the proceedings. Buckle up, because things are about to get even more heated. Ms. Beversdorf, you have opened your case against Mrs. James to prove that her deceased son, Daryl, is the biological father of your four-year-old son, Dakari. That once you prove paternity, Ms. Better accept you both or she will never see Dakari again. Hold on to your seats. Mrs. James expresses doubt about Dakari's paternity, noting her son Daryl's skepticism. She reveals having asked Ms. Beversdorf for a DNA test three times, which Ms. Beversdorf allegedly refused, further intensifying the dispute and highlighting the core issue of the case. The tension is building. Just wait for what's next. You say that your deceased son has constant doubt about the paternity of Dakari and you know he's not your grandchild. You state that you asked the plaintiff to take a DNA test three times, but Ms. Beversdorf refused. You have come to clear your son's name. You won't believe this twist. Ms. Beversdorf passionately argues that the denial of Dakari's paternity is hurting both her and her son. She expresses a desire for acceptance and love, stressing the emotional toll the situation is taking. This moment highlights the personal stakes involved in the case. Hang tight. The emotional roller coaster is just getting started. They just, it's the whole denial thing that's affecting my child and me. They don't accept him. They don't accept me. I'm just ready for him. Love. I want to real, not fake, you know what I'm saying? Just feel like that's all family, not just my side. I want it to be genuine, and I just know once I get these test results, it will be genuine, and everybody will really know the truth. Did that just happen? Judge Lake acknowledges Mrs. James's loss of her son and explores her reasons for doubt. Mrs. James discusses the tumultuous relationship between Daryl and Ms. Beversdorf, suggesting that Ms. Beversdorf's behavior contributed to the paternity doubts. This exchange underlines the complexity of personal relationships within the case. You'll be on the edge of your seat for the next part. I'm first, I'm sorry for the loss of son. Thank you. I would like to know, you say the doubts were brought because of Ms. Beaver's door? Yes, because of the relationship that they beheld uh, in the time that he was with her. They always fighting, breaking up. Nobody has proof of that, though. I've never been with anybody else. You haven't been seen with Facebook. anybody else. You're gone two weeks, and, and I'm like, where's Kaylee? No, like, I was gone two weeks. Where? This just got real. Mrs. James details a period when Ms. Beversdorf was absent, which she implies could be suspicious regarding Dakari's paternity. This accusation leads to a heated exchange, illustrating the high emotions and the lack of trust between the parties. Wait until you hear what comes next. It's a doozy. They had broken up, and two weeks she was gone, and I was already my pregnant, son. Your Honor. I and, was already pregnant. And the pregnant. next week she came back, Your Honor, and now they're telling me that she was pregnant. And you want me to say, well, okay? I was already pregnant when me and him split up for the two weeks. Respectfully, how does Miss James know that? Because you and him then had a fight. She leaves for a couple of weeks, come back, next thing I know, son, her and my son sitting in my kitchen telling me she's pregnant. Talk about a plot twist. The discussion about the birth certificate arises. It's revealed that Daryl did not sign the birth certificate because he was temporarily absent from the hospital, adding a layer of legal uncertainty to Dakari's paternity and identity. The surprises keep coming. Don't miss what happens next. But if you don't know that that's your child, why are you in the hospital? Because he loved why do you. you do, him do all that if that's not your child? Did Who he sign that? the birth certificate? No. When the nurse came into the hospital room, he was at home taking a shower, getting clothes. He only left the hospital for maybe two and a half hours. Was the one time they came in with the birth certificate for him to execute? Yes. This segment is a bombshell. Mrs. James recounts her efforts to obtain a DNA test after Daryl's death to establish Dakari's entitlement to social security benefits, which Ms. Beversdorf reportedly evaded. This moment emphasizes the practical implications of the paternity test beyond emotional and relational aspects. Strap in for the next revelation. It's a big one. Deny that. If I'm so confident, well, why didn't test. you come and kick? It doesn't make any sense. So you're on. I would test when I'm so confident to come on here to prove about my son's father. You've never test. even been asked. No. You're on it. I would never deny that. Just like I didn't deny coming out here. You was out here because oh. I told you I was not going to put him on my 401k and now that my brother has died on my insurance, you got mad because you felt like he needed Daryl's money. You're not ready for this. The climactic moment occurs as Judge Lake reads the DNA test results. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Mrs. Jacqueline James and Dakari is 99%. You you are related. 
Can you believe this drama is unfolding before our eyes? The case of Williams Jr. v. Sir Davis kicks off. Mr. Williams claims that a fleeting one-night stand with Miss Davis four years back has entangled him in a paternity dispute he vehemently denies. On top of that, he's suing Miss Davis for selling his beloved 1994 Pontiac Firebird without his nod. Buckle up, we're just diving into the juicy bits. Mr. Williams, you claim four years ago you had a one-night stand with Fendant Miss Davis, and today you're here to prove you did bother her three-year-old son, Charles. Additionally, you are suing Davis for conversion. You claim she sold your 1994 Pontiac Firebird valued at $2,500 without your permission. Just when you think it's straightforward, there's a twist. Mr. Williams recounts that infamous night, a party that turned into a one-night rendezvous with Miss Davis. Amidst the revelry and too many drinks, he admits the details are fuzzy, especially about protection. The plot thickens. So don't wander off now. I met Miss Davis about four years ago. Party, a uh, party atmosphere and everything. We party, spending the night together that night. So it was, in your mind, a one-night stand? Yes, Your Honor. Did you use protection? Because I was inebriated I, and it was four years ago, I'm not positive that I did use that. All right. The plot thickens. Miss Davis throws her certainty into the ring, insisting Mr. Williams is definitely the father, based on their brief encounter during a split with her then-boyfriend. As the stakes escalate, keep your eyes peeled. You won't want to miss what's coming. Okay, at the time I was in a relationship, so I was for certain that my boyfriend was my child father. How did you get to the point where you got a boyfriend, but you have to party and having a one night stand, Mr. Williams. We was broken up, but we wasn't. We was split it for a couple of days. Okay. And I was just mingling, and that's when I met. It's always on the break, Ron. Always <laughs> the break. How are you so certain he's the father? For one, she's not. <laughs> Talk about a curveball. The story spirals as Miss Davis admits there were other contenders for paternity during the conception window. This revelation throws a wrench into the works, multiplying the doubts and drama. Fasten your seatbelts. It's getting bumpy. Now, anybody else? That's what I need to ask. Uh, yes, it was another man. So there was another man that you had sex with as well? Yes. During the window of conception? Yes, the beginning of September. So this calendar is full. Before I go further, is there anyone else besides the other man? No, you're right. It would have to be at least three or four other people that she was intimate with during that time, during that window of conception. And just when you thought paternity was the only issue, we shift gears to the saga of the missing car. Mr. Williams recounts how his Pontiac vanished while parked at Miss Davis's residence, and he suspects foul play. The intrigue deepens, and something tells me you'll want to see what happens next. What happened to the car, Ms. Davis? I don't know anything about a car. I don't know. So you don't remember the car being in front of your house? No, I don't. Your Honor, I'm... She said she doesn't remember I, I a car in front of her house. He don't have her evidence house. or he don't have no kind of proof that I did Did you ever ride car. in the car? I so you knew which car it was. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, it was gone. You couldn't make this up if you tried. Emotions overflow as Miss Davis accuses Mr. Williams of dipping in and out of the child's life on a whim. She questions his sincerity and his sudden presence. The emotional roller coaster is just reaching the peak, so don't go anywhere. Yes. He showed up to try to be in the child's life. Yes, he did. But he showed up with company. Right, but he was staying in my mother's house every day with me and my son. So if me, personally, if you feel like you're not other of a child, why are you around? I why mean, not? That doesn't make sense. Why not? Why not? If you I, knew it, you it, didn't have a DNA well, test result, why would you father or a role of a child that feels not, not sure? Okay, hold on now. Every testimony adds another layer to this tangled tale. Skeptic about the DNA test validity surfaces with Miss Bryant, Mr. Williams's current girlfriend, highlighting discrepancies and suspicious delays. As the tension mounts, brace yourself for an explosive revelation. I don't so, believe it. You don't, don't believe, believe it. it. Because they had took a test, a home kit test, was supposed to be back in two days, two and a half weeks to get the test back. But on the box it said two days. She finally said she got the test back two and a half weeks, two and a half weeks later, come back. We're expecting to come over there and get a paper saying, hey, this is your son to, for Mr. Eddie Williams. This bomb shell will knock your socks off. In a shocking twist, Miss Davis admits she never actually submitted the DNA test, throwing the entire case into a frenzy of doubt and disbelief. Just when you think it can't get more chaotic, the next moment will floor you. I never turned the test in. That is but sad. She, but she's ready, she's ready to put me on child. So why go through the whole trouble of giving them this email address and this if you never turn the test in? So the whole story about you getting results via email was a lie? It wasn't a lie. It, it just Mr. wasn't Williams, the truth. Mr. Williams knew that he had to pay the 44 Oh, we're not talking about 44. Okay. You're talking about the result. Lawrence. Did you tell them that you had a result? Yeah. Expect the unexpected. As the judge deliberates over the fate of the vanished Pontiac, the absence of concrete evidence forces a dismissal of the car lawsuit. But keep your ears open, because the real showstopper is just around the corner. I have listened. I've listened to her. I've listened to you. 
I don't know what happened to the car, but unfortunately you have not presented enough evidence to this court to, that she was responsible for its disappearance or it being sold. For that reason, I have to dismiss you. That's fine. That's All right? Fine. Here comes the moment of truth. The DNA results are finally disclosed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. William, you are the father. <laughs> Buckle up, folks. The episode kicks off with the announcement of the case, Markham Love Verve Tucker Golston, setting the stage for a drama-filled showdown. This legal dispute involves Ms. Markham Love and two potential fathers, Mr. Tucker and Mr. Golston. The twisty tale hints at a deeply entangled mess of paternity and emotional identity, all woven through her past roller coaster experiences in foster care. And just when you think you know what's up, the plot thickens. Stay tuned. Ms. Markham Love, you're here because you say your childhood was a nightmare. Wow. You claim your mother Mother, Ms. Nasiri Poor lost you to foster care and left you torn between two fathers, including the defendant. You won't believe this. Mr. Tucker shares a bombshell, recalling a jaw-dropping court hearing years ago where he first discovered there was a question about his paternity. This revelation stirs up a whirlwind of emotional and legal chaos, throwing familial relationships, especially concerning paternity, into a tailspin. Just as the audience catches their breath, the emotional ante is upped even further. Watch what happens next. You say a bomb was dropped on you. Years ago, you showed up to a court hearing to gain custody of Ms. Markham Love. You claimed that day her mother delivered the news to you that you may not be her biological father. Grab some tissues. Ms. Markham Love opens up about her turbulent childhood, marked by a dizzying array of foster homes and deep emotional scars. She drops a major truth bomb about learning at age 12 that Mr. Tucker might not be her biological father, shining a spotlight on the profound personal impacts of her mother's life choices. But hang tight, the emotional roller coaster is just getting started. Please explain to the court, why was your childhood a nightmare? Got put in foster care, had to live with complete strangers. I don't have respect for anyone telling me what to do, or even Shireen. I don't have a close bond with her. I've been living from foster home to foster. I found out at 12 that Myron here, Mr. Tucker, may not be my father. Oh, it's heating up now. A fiery exchange erupts between Mr. Tucker and Ms. Nasirapur, Ms. Markham Love's mother, over decisions that shaped their current predicament. This clash uncovers layers of unresolved issues and tensions, complicating their relationships, and Ms. Markham Love's quest for identity. The air crackles with drama, and trust me, you don't want to miss what's coming up next. Shireen had told my grandma, Miss Nasiri Poor. Miss Nasiri Poor told my grandmother it was related to me. And so when you heard that, what did you think? I felt hurt, betrayed, and lost with emotion. Did you ever meet the person they said was supposed to be your biological yes, father? Yes, Your Honor. I met him one time. He took me and my sister out to ice cream. That was the only time I seen him. Barely talked to him on Facebook. Things are getting spicy. The courtroom becomes a battleground as accusations fly and denials clash, revealing the emotional complexities and deep-seated pain often lurking behind cases involving family secrets and paternity doubts. As the accusations pile up, the stakes get even higher. Brace yourselves because what happens next will knock your socks off. How did you do the things forth. for her to get in foster care? If I was such a bad mom, All right, at listen, that time, you should have done listen, about listen. It. Back then, when you say the test should have been taken, did you consider taking one? Why didn't you? I mean, that's kind of a good because question. Because I, I didn't find out. Why not just, I'd like to take a DNA test? I didn't find out that I was in question until the court date. Everyone's on the edge of their seats. As the court proceedings continue, Ms. Markham Love voices her longing for closure and a clearer understanding of her heritage. Her heartfelt story captures the universal struggle of many seeking to piece together their origins amid legal battles and personal turmoil. And just when you think you've seen it all, the next next twist comes barreling down the pipe. So in your mind, you were the father. There was no reason to daughter. Exactly. That's seven the way I still feel so right now. So you oh heard this in court. At seven years old. Did you say, I'd like a test now? No. So at that point, why not? You just said. Because I feel in my heart that she's mine. You emotional. I don't pity and for you him. feel hurt because. Feel, Ma'am, if you don't be quiet and let me get a question out. <laughs> You think you know, but you have no idea. More details emerge about the family dynamics and Mr. Tucker's mysterious absence, characterized by deceit and poor communication. This segment offers a revealing glimpse into the misunderstandings and challenges that can perpetuate strife within families. As the truth slowly unravels, prepare for the next scene. It's a real doozy. You supposed to be out playing basketball? Mm. And where were you? Wedding reception. What? There's a lot more to this mm. story. No, no, don't, don't start saying. talking soft now. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot more to this story than what she's saying. But it's true true that you were living with them as a family and then you disappeared you went and got married to someone else yes 
wait for it, the peak of the episode arrives with the DNA test results. As it pertains to 22-year-old Britt Markham Love, Mr. Tucker, you are not her father. Buckle up, folks. Ms. Campbell steps up, all nerves and hope, desperate to find out if Mr. Rogers is indeed the father of her three-week-old wonder child. Meanwhile, Mr. Rogers, tangled in matrimonial and extra-matrimonial knots, grapples with his heartstrings over potentially not being the daddy. Get ready, because this baby drama is just... Ms. Campbell drops a bombshell. She's not just with Mr. Rogers, but also his wife. Cue the audience gasps and clutching of pearls as the court delves into this love triangle. Or is it a square? You won't believe how they got into this mess, so stay tuned. Ms. Campbell... Dive into this backstory. Mr. Rogers unwraps the tale of their 20-year marriage with Angela and how Gracie got thrown into the mix. Initially, it was all girls' business until he got the invite a year later. As the plot thickens, you'll see just how complicated their happy home is. Angela. Well, here's a doozy. At a swingers club, both women, unbeknownst to Mr. Rogers, take a walk on the wild side with another guy, shaking the very foundations of their agreement. Unprotected and unplanned, this night out might just rewrite their family tree. What happens as the tension hits a peak, Ms. Campbell owns up to a possible slip-up around the time of conception. Hearts pound as she voices her hopes that Mr. Rogers is the father. The suspense is killing, and you'll want to see how the judge cuts through this tangled web. And for the grand finale, Austin's results are revealed. Mr. Rogers, you've waited 18 years for these results, and the wait is over. You are his father. <laughs> Here's where things get juicy. Mrs. Eastridge is at her wit's end, hoping to glue her marriage back together. Because let's be real, DNA drama over her son Wesley has turned their home into an episode of constant bickering. She's in court today to prove to her hubby that he really is Wesley's dad and hopefully patch things up at home. The judge nods along, clearly understanding how much is riding on today's revelations. Brace yourself, because just when you think you've seen it all, the next revelation is a doozy. You are here hoping to save your marriage cause DNA doubts surrounding your son Wesley has led to con constant arguments with your husband. You've opened your case, prove to your husband that he is Wesley's father and repair the damage to your marriage. Can you feel the tension in the air? Mr. Eastridge is laying it all out, sharing how the whispers of Wesley's paternity have turned his life upside down, suspecting that his wife might have reignited an old flame with her ex, which has him losing sleep. The emotional turmoil is palpable, as the stakes of the DNA test couldn't be higher. Mrs. Eastridge then paints a picture of a marriage hanging by a thread, riddled with doubts planted by both their families. And guess what? It spirals even further in the next clip. Would you say doubts surrounding Wesley's paternity have caused pain in your marriage? You claim your wife slept with her ex, leading you to question if Wesley, your biological son. So, Mrs. Eastridge, describe the current status of your marriage. Well, our marriage is actually on the line right now. His family's put a lot of doubt in his head, and so is mine. Buckle up. This ride's getting bumpier. They dive into the daily chaos at home, where the topic of Wesley's dad is like a broken record, causing friction. Mr. Eastridge can't shake the feeling that he doesn't see himself in Wesley, and boy, does that haunt him. This seed of doubt was planted during a fiery argument when Mrs. Eastridge, maybe out of spite, dropped the bomb that Wesley might be her ex's kid. Hang tight, because what comes next will have your jaw on the floor. So, Mr. Eastridge, you have doubt? I don't think he looks like me. I just... What's going on in your home? Are you arguing about paternity? Yes. How did the argument start? Well, the argument started, um, got mad at me one day, and we was arguing. But while she was pregnant, she told me that she was leaving to one of her family members' house and that for me not to worry about her or the baby because that baby's father, that it's her ex's baby. Backtrack to the beginning of this soap opera. The court takes us back to when these two lovebirds met at a military academy, fell head over heels, and tied the knot right after graduation, only to find out they were going to be parents almost immediately. Timing is everything, and the math here has Mr. Eastridge sweating bullets over the real daddy drama. Keep your eyes peeled because the next part of their tale is about to add more spice to the mix. So you really can't blame him for being doubtful because you said it. You're right, I don't, but I just want to prove to him, hey. Tell me about your relationship. How did you all meet? We actually met at a military academy. Okay, so you were going to school? We got together and pretty much we've been together off and on. How many years? How many, how long? Since I was 14 and he was 15. Yes, Your Honor. And then you decided to get married? Yes, Your Honor. Just when you think it couldn't get messier, we learn about Mrs. Eastridge's ex, who not only stuck around but was practically part of the family furniture, much to Mr. Eastridge's dismay. This ongoing connection between her ex and her family only fuels Mr. Eastridge's suspicions and paranoia about the possible behind-the-scenes romance. Fasten your seatbelts, folks, because the revelations coming up are going to make this look like child's play, 
So you weren't married yet when Wesley was conceived. No, Your Honor. And you weren't sure whether or not she had been intimate with someone else. But clearly something else had to happen if eternity of the child is in question. He lived with my family. After we broke up, they let him live there. He lived there for ever since me and Anthony got together, pretty much. So your ex remained close to your family. He made sure that he was there. You won't believe this bombshell. Mrs. Eastridge confesses to a fling with her ex during a rocky phase with Mr. Eastridge, although she's quick to clarify the timeline to defend the paternity of her son. This crucial confession might just be the key to solving the mystery of Wesley's dad, yet she stands her ground, adamant about her current husband's fatherhood. The aftermath of this confession is up next, and it's a roller coaster. At some point, you hit a really rocky point because you broke up. Yes. What happened? It was February 2016. We had actually split up and my ex was at my mom's. And of course I was a little bit, I was depressed. So I was drinking and we ended up doing what we probably shouldn't have. And so you had sex with your ex? Yes, in February of 2016. The conception date of my son is April 1st through April 11th. Anthony is the father, I know this for a fact, because of the conception date. Just when you're ready to catch your breath. As the court session hits its peak, allegations fly from family members claiming Mrs. Eastridge has been a little too social, adding fuel to the fiery paternity debate. This family drama unfolds like a primetime reality show, with the DNA test looming as the season finale that could either mend or end this marriage. As the tension builds to its breaking point, get ready because the results are about to drop like a hot potato. So I'm positive Wesley is not Mr. Eastridge's baby. That seems consistent to what you testified to your family members that you are not Wesley's biological father. And even with your family members' thoughts earned, you still have developed a relationship with this baby. It's not his fault I'm not his father, so I shouldn't take that out on him. And here's the moment of truth. The envelope finally arrives, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. Eastridge, you are the father.